Black history. According to the public school system, Negroes were brought to America in 1619, forced to work as slaves on plantations until one day this great white man named Abraham Lincoln came along and felt bad for the slaves and signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, which freed the slaves. But there were still some bad whiteies in the southern states that passed Jim Crow laws for segregation. Afterwards, there came more whites that felt bad and then gave blacks civil rights in the 1960s, then allowed a black man to have the presidential office named Barack Obama. Now blacks are finally equal to whites. We can all get along. The end. Now, moving right along to our English lecture for the day. Uh, I don't think so. Black history. What do you know about black history? Let me ask you a question. Prior to the transatlantic slave trade in the 1600s, what was your nationality? What did you call yourself? Some may say African. Well, Africa is a continent, and in that continent, there's over 47 different countries in there. Which one do you come from? What language did you speak prior to the 1600s? Was it English? There's over 1,500 dialects being spoken in the land of Africa. Pick one. What clothing did you wear? Was it high heels and stilettos? Skinny jeans and vans? What food did you eat? Hamburgers and hot dogs? French fries and SpaghettiOs? What religion did you partake in? Who was your God? Was it Christianity and Cesare Bolger? Most of you have no idea about the answer to these questions. You have no recollection of any history prior to the transatlantic slave trade. Now, is that a coincidence or by random chance? I don't think so. Have you ever asked yourself, why is it that in the public school system that every time the subject of black history is taught, it always begins in the 1600s and with slavery? Why is that? Doesn't that raise some antennas and spark inquiry? Why is it that the public school system is so committed to revolving black history solely on the past 400 years. Why is that? Uh, is it because there's a deficiency in historical data? Or maybe because there's no history at all prior to the 1600s? Maybe black people just poofed out of thin air, sporadically landed on slave ships, and they said, hey, we got a new species here and start importing and exporting them all over the world. Maybe that's what happened. The question arises, what is the drawback on this history? Why does it keep being withheld? What's the big idea about it? Why is it being held hostage? That's the question. Why can't it be expounded on? A hundred years prior to the 1600s? 300 years? 500 years? A thousand years? Why is that information not being revealed? What's the big secret? What's the mysticism about it? What you're going to come to realize is that your identity is the biggest kept secret on the planet Earth. Oh, you thought that NASA and the space station and the secret missions being conducted by them, oh, you thought that was the biggest kept secret on Earth. No, this is bigger than that. You thought that the government and the CIA and the FBI hiding information about UFOs and Planet X and Nubaru and aliens, you thought that was the biggest information and biggest kept secret. No, this is bigger than that. The elite Confederate has spent billions of dollars and constructed an innumerable amount of psychological stratagem 
to ensure that you never received and acquired this information that's about to be put out. You're about to receive pertinent information from some of the most reputable biblical scholars, historians, and archaeologists. And they all know something that you don't know. And that's your identity. Ham, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of eight persons to live through the flood, he became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. Wait, the churches and the pastors, which are set up by the government, all teach in unison a doctrine that all black people come from the seed of Ham. But once you open up scholastic sources, you'll find out that the biblical scholars say something totally different from what's taught in Orthodox Christianity. What do they mean by Ham is the father of the dark races but not the Negroes? The Negroes themselves are a dark race of people, so how can you say that Ham is the father of all these dark races and exclude the Negroes? What are the biblical scholars trying to convey? What the biblical scholars are saying is that you're not African. There's only four families according to the Bible that make up the native population of Africa or the land of Ham. And the biblical scholars know that you don't descend from any one of those four families. In order to write that in a scholastic and academic book, the biblical scholars have done extensive and thorough research on both the so-called Negroes and the Africans, the native Africans. And they've came to the conclusion after the extensive research that the Negroes don't have anything to do with the native Africans at all. They're two totally separate people. In the 1840s, Morton collaborated with George R. Glyden, an Egyptologist who provided him with mummy heads and information about the racial significance of Egyptian tomb inscriptions. In Crania Egyptiaca, published in 1844, Morton pointed out that both cranial and archaeological evidence showed that the Egyptians were not Negroes. In 1840, Dr. Morton was trying to find out the racial origin of the so-called Negroes that were in America in slavery. So he got together with the Egyptologists, which supplied him with the mummy heads, and what he did was conduct an extensive research on the cranial remains of the, uh, the heads in Egypt uh, in contrast to the cranial remains of the heads in America. And what he found out is that the Negroes that were in slavery were not Africans. He found out that the skulls were two totally different types of skulls. The Negro's head was longer than the Egyptian head. The physical characteristics from the outside look similar with the thick lips and the broad nose. But once you start delving into the, the real characteristics, they found out that they were two totally different people as abolitionists and colonizationists had maintained, and that in fact, blacks had been relegated to the same servile position in ancient Egypt as in modern America. But what Dr. Morton did discover is that the Negroes that were serving slavery in America served the same position and servitude in ancient Egypt when they matched other skulls and other cranial remains in Egypt. They said, these are exact matches. So what are the scholars saying? What you're gonna find out is that they're saying that you are the biblical Israelites. Yes, you're the same exact people that served slavery in the land of Egypt. You're the same exact people that God sent Moses to go redeem under the hand of Pharaoh. You're the same exact people. And when you read the Bible, you'll find out that slavery is a central theme in the Bible. It's a reoccurring theme with the Israelites. The Israelites cannot run away and get away from serving slavery. It continues to happen over and over, all the way up until today. You came out of Egypt as slaves. 
came down into the land of Israel, no sooner as you got there, then you had the Assyrians come, capture the land of Israel, and take you and make you slaves. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria. You came out of the land of Assyria, went back to the land of Israel, then the Babylonians came, which are the modern day Ethiopians, the Cushites, came to the land of Israel and made you slaves. So all Israel were reckoned by genealogies. And behold, they were written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, who were carried away to Babylon for their transgression. You came out of the Babylonian captivity, went back to the land of Israel, then the Persians came on down there, took the Israelites, and made you slaves. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia. You came back from the Persian Medo captivity, went back to the land of Israel, rebuilt the temple up. Then the Greeks came on down there, took you and made you slaves to entreat them that they would take the yoke from them. For they saw that the kingdom of the Grecians did oppress Israel with servitude. After you came from the Greek captivity, you went back into the land of Israel, rebuilt the temple because the Greeks were uh, sacrificing swine and pig on the altars. No soon as you came back to the land of Israel, then the Romans came and had you during the time of Christ as slaves. It was so much slavery going on with the Israelites that Jeremiah himself had to ask. Is, he had to say, is, is Israel just put on earth just to be slaves? Is that your whole purpose? Just to be servitude to other nations? Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? So you might be asking yourself, if the so-called Negro is part of the 12 tribes of Israel, how in the world did you get to the west coast of Africa? And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. This is Christ right here speaking to the Israelites. He says, when you see Jerusalem compassed or surrounded by the Roman armies, then know that the desolation or the destruction of the land of Israel is getting ready to happen. The Romans getting ready to come in here and tear some stuff up. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And Christ says, when you see the Romans coming in, you better get ready to flee into the mountains. And what you're gonna realize is that the mountains that he was talking about was the land of Africa. It was the same exact place that Mary and Joseph took Jesus when they were fleeing from Herod when he was trying to come find Jesus to kill him. They went right into Africa. And the Israelites went into Africa as well, fleeing from the Romans. In the year 65 BC, the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son Titus put an end to the Jewish state with great slaughter. During the period from Pompey to Julius, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled into Africa, fleeing from Roman persecution and slavery. The slave markets were full of black Jewish slaves. Over one million of you Israelites fled from the land of Israel into the land of Africa, running away from the Romans because the Romans was coming to put slaughter to the Israelites. The ones that didn't take heed to the prophecy of Christ, when he said, you better leave and go to the mountains, go to Africa. When they got caught by the Romans, they were taken back to Europe and sold in slavery and put in servitude and became gladiators, put in the lion's dens. The pagans and the Romans attacked the Jews indiscriminately. Both the Jewish soldiers and the uninvolved peaceful population without mercy. As a result of this merciless attack, 
Many Jews fled to those parts of Northwest Africa known as Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Mauritania. Many other Jews fled to other areas where Rome did not have any jurisdiction. This was to the region of the South, the Sahara Desert, and the Sudan. Grazel says, such is the explanation of how the Sahara Desert first acquired Jewish tribes, toughened by a fighting tradition and possessed of physical characteristics, black, which it is said still makes them approximate very closely the original Jewish population of Palestine. And after migrating from Israel and dwelling on the northwestern parts of Africa, after you were fighting vigorously with the Romans, you had no choice but to start migrating to the southern regions of Africa where the Romans didn't have any jurisdiction. Because the Romans were relentless and they were adamant about putting all Israelites to death. So in order to get any type of peace, the Israelites had to start migrating to the sub-Sahara parts of Africa. The scholars know this for a fact. The biblical scholars know this for a fact. They know all the history of the Israelites and their migration patterns. Whatever may be thought of the more or less mythological traditions connected with the earliest Jews in North Africa, it is now practically an established fact that a Jewish nation, Jewish at least in faith, and perhaps to in origin, long held sway south of the Sahara. In later centuries, Jews are believed to have settled in Western Africa during the height of the Songhai, Mali, Ghana, and Canaan Bornu empires. According to accounts from explorers of the region, several powerful Jewish families of the Songhai empire were of Jewish origin. Some accounts place West African Jewish communities in the Andu forest of Dahomey, south of Timbuktu. In the 1930s, these groups still maintained a Torah scroll written in Aramaic that had been burned into parchment with a hot iron instead of ink so it could not be changed. In the 1930s, the historians went over there and still found Israelites over there that didn't get captured in the slave trade, still practicing the Hebraic faith, still knowing who they were. With a Torah, which is the first five books of Moses, written in Aramaic. That's the ancient language. And it's a shame that they have to burn it in hot iron so nope, so the European colonialists don't come over there tampering with it and taking the evidence and trying to hide the history. It's a shame that they have to do that. It is a total shame that they have to do that. The black Jews had an advantage over the African tribes. They carried their culture, history, laws, and written records with them. The Jews made use of every opportunity. They were an industrious and skillful people. In the Jewish Ghanaian states were found kings, princes, governors, generals, secretaries, treasurers, revenue agents, judges, architects, engineers, doctors, historians, language interpreters, mathematicians, jewelers, sculptors, masons, carpenters, painters of art, goldsmiths, leather workers, potters, armorers, saddlers, blacksmith, agriculturalist, etc. Who told you that you was a bunch of Negroes running around on the west coast of Africa, butt naked, swinging from vines? Who told you that lie? You were and still are a prestigious people, a skillful people. The decline of Jewish communities of the West African Maghreb most likely began with the influx of Arab invaders into North Africa starting in 640 CE and later into West Africa in the 1300s and 14 CE. So after you had established communities and empires on the West Coast of Africa, after the seventh century, that's when Muhammad and his band of 
thugs came down there to the West Coast with the Quran in one hand and a sword in another one. And they were forcibly converting the Israelites into that nonsense Islam. Yeah, I said it, nonsense Islam, because that's not what we were dealing with. That's the Arabs' religion. That's not what we were dealing with. And that was the decline of the Hebraic community over there in the west coast of Africa. And that was, was the forefront uh, in the beginning of the slave trade. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? Tyre, Zidon, and the coast of Palestine, those are all ancient Africans that God is referring to. Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me, swiftly and speedily will I return your recompense upon your own head. Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians. The Africans got together with the so-called Grecians or the Europeans and they commenced in selling the Israelites that were dwelling on the west coast of Africa in slavery. There's your slave trade right there in the Bible. Both buyers, Europeans, and sellers, Africans, saw the people traded into captivity on the African coast as outsiders. Now, why do those Africans see you as outsiders? Because you were some people that migrated and encroached on their land. They knew you were not the same exact people. The customs that you had, the way you moved, they knew you were not the same people, so they had no problem commencing in a slave trade with the Europeans. Do you be crazy to believe that Africans were selling their own people? That makes no sense at all. When the Europeans put that in the textbooks, they're using technicalities saying Africans sold other Africans. When they, they be, they're using technicalities. What they mean to say is native Africans were selling Israelites that were living in Africa. It'd be no different if somebody wrote history of 500 years from now and say there was a, a slave trade that happened here in America. Say black people got together and start selling white people to the Chinese. If somebody with the same mindset that the Europeans have wrote history 500 years from now, they would say Americans were selling other Americans to the Chinese. When in, it's two totally different nation, nation of people living in America. You can't just say Americans sold other Americans, two totally different people. It's the same exact scenario on the west coast of Africa. There are both oral and written explanations that trace the origin of the Igbo. And the most tantalizing is an association of the Igbo to the Hebrew race. This assumption is based on the fact that Igbo culture has many similar traditional customs like that of the Jews. Similar customs are observed in marriage negotiations, childbirth and circumcision, restitution, attitude to totem animals and taboos, as well as hospitality to others, especially to strangers etc. The Ibu are therefore said to be the split and lost group or tribe of Israel that refused to wander further northeast with Moses but preferred going down southward. The Ibo people have many Jewish traditions. Naom Katz, the current Israeli ambassador in Nigeria, and others point to their possible ancient Israelite origins. See, the scholars, they've done their research on the Igbo tribe, extensive research. And they've compared the traditions of the Igbo tribe, and they've matched them up to the biblical traditions of the Israelites. And they said, whoa, these are strikingly similar. The only way that these people could be, could be practicing the Hebraic faith this close is if they were the biblical Israelites themselves. So you may ask yourself, what is the significance of the Igbo tribe to the so-called Negro in the Americas? When you do the research, what you're gonna find out is that the Igbo tribe 
is one of the main sought out tribes that were captured and sold in the transatlantic slave trade and came right here to America. The British were the major buyers before they banned their own slave traffic in 1807. They were replaced by the Portuguese and the Spanish for as long as the traffic continued here. The majority of the captives were speakers of Igbo dialects. You, you can hear me clearly, uh, Rabbi. Let us have your name once more. Uh, my name is Rabbi Yehuda Ben Shomer. Okay. Well, is it okay if we just called you Yehuda? Uh, yeah, that's short fine. Today? No, yeah, okay, that's right. fine. No problem at all. I'll go on even further to say this, that the, um, the slave trade... Uh, is, is actually connected to Deuteronomy 28 because the majority of the slaves that were brought to the Caribbean islands and brought to the Americas were Ibu people, were people of Hebrew and Hebraic Israelite descent, if you will. And so if you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, it matches perfectly what happened to the Hebrew slaves, the black Hebrew slaves, during the slave oh. trade. It just matches oh, it perfectly. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, back up now. I think I think we just rung a bell here. Hold up now. <laughs> okay. Hold, hold up, hold up. Hold hold the presses. <laughs> okay. Hold, hold up. I hope everyone is listening to this. This is this is uh you about to rock some boats now, uh uh Ben Ben uh Ben Yehuda there. Uh hold one hold hold up now. Listen to what he's saying here. So you are saying that there's a great chance, or more so, that the black people that links directly to the slave trade are from the lost tribes of Israel. Is that what you're saying here, sir? Yes, I am. Now, now, granted, I will qualify oh, oh, that I don't... Oh, wait, oh, wait a second. Oh, I don't believe that I, every I would, single black person is... Hebraic or Jewish, but I'm saying that the majority of the slaves involved in the slave trade were Hebrews. These people knew exactly who they were buying and selling, both the Africans and the Europeans. The Europeans, which are the Romans, the Romans went after 70 AD, they went conquering and they done hid themselves under different nationalities after they done conquered the native people that were in those lands in Europe. Hid themselves under the French, under the British, under the Portuguese. They're the same exact Romans. And all they're doing is continuing the agenda that was put in place in 70 AD. When they came down there looking for the Israelites, it's the same exact agenda. And carrying it forward to today. It's the same exact agenda. They knew exactly who they were aiming for. It's not by coincidence that all the history matches up perfectly with the Bible prophecy. It's not a coincidence. And then they push a doctrine on you in church talking about it doesn't matter. So then you never go and look for this information. Now you see exactly why they don't put none of this in black history, why they don't go prior to the 1600s. You start digging prior to the 1600s and then you find out you come or descend from the Igbo tribe. You start doing your research. Well, let me find out a little bit more about this Igbo tribe. Then you find out that the Igbo tribe are known as fact, descend from the 12 tribes of Israel. So then you say, hold on, hold on. Something's not right here. That's the exact reason why they don't go prior, they don't go prior to the 1600s. You're not supposed to find out this information. You're supposed to keep, they're supposed to keep renaming your nationalities every few years to cause confusion and to have you confused not knowing who you are. Each time, each year, something else come out. First you call Negro, then you call color. Then uh, 10 years later, they switch it to African American. It's all by design. Now you have to be asking yourself, if you are supposed to be the people of God, the chosen people of God, why is it that he continues to allow you to keep going into slavery after slavery after slavery? And why does he have you building up everybody's civilization 
off of the back of your slave labor. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt show this people all these words, and they shall say unto thee, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then thou shalt say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. What you're going to realize is that when Moses brought you out of the land of Egypt and you entered into the wilderness, you entered into a covenant with the Most High God, the creator of everything you see in heaven and in earth. You entered in a blood in and blood out agreement with the creator. And he kept his end of the bargain, but you never kept yours. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord have said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Once Moses sprinkled the blood on you, there was no way out of it. You entered into the covenant and it shall come to pass. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations on the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. You see, if you kept your end of the bargain, the deal was the Most High was gonna set you above all nations on the planet Earth. You know, the same spot that the Europeans have today, that was supposed to be your spot if you kept his law, statutes, and commandments. But, but, that means there's a stipulation. There's two sides of the bargain. It shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand, Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee, and they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness, and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. God says you'd have the yokes of iron on your neck until he have destroyed you. So that means when he take the yokes of iron off, you were destroyed. When did that happen? 
1863, when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. The yokes of iron came off, but at that time, your whole history had been whipped out of you. When the master gives you something, you take it. He gave it a name. It's a nice name. It's Toby. And it's going to be yours till the day you die. Now, I know you understand me. And I want to hear it. Again! I want to hear you say your name. Your name is Toby. What's your name? Gunther. Lord God, help that boy. They're going to whip him dead. What's your name? Say it. Toby, who are you? Say your name. <laughs> What's your name? Toby. So that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil towards his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave. You wonder why it's black on black crime? You didn't keep your part of the covenant. You wonder why black men always leave the children? You didn't keep your part of the covenant. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. Why are you number one in HIV? You didn't keep your part of the covenant. Why are you number one in hypertension and high blood pressure? You didn't keep your part of the covenant. Why are you number one in high cholesterol? You didn't keep your part of the covenant. Why are you number one in diabetes? You didn't keep your part of the covenant. Why are you number one in all negative effects across the board? You didn't keep your part of the covenant. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night and have no assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even? And in the evening thou shalt say, would God it were morning? For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again. The word Egypt in the Bible means bondage or slavery. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So when God says he's going to bring you into Egypt again, he's saying, I'm going to bring you into slavery again with ships. But this time you're going with ships packed up like sardines in a can. By the way, whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there, Ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women, and no man shall buy you. And God says, no man shall buy you. Back in the biblical days, you would be able to buy or redeem a slave by payment. But God says, no man is going to be able to redeem you out of this slavery. 
This last one I bring you to, this last Egypt, nobody's gonna get you out of it. Marcus Garvey tried to get you out of it, didn't work. Martin Luther King tried to get you out of it, didn't work. Malcolm X tried to get you out of it, didn't work. Louis Farrakhan tried to get you out of it, didn't work. Al Sharpton tried to get you out of it, didn't work. Why? Because you are still breaking the covenant. If you're the real Israelites, who are these people over there in the land of Israel claiming to be you? Those are Romans, Europeans. They got pushed up in the South Georgia, Russia, in the Caucasus Mountains, and hid themselves under the name of Khazars. Between the 8th and 9th century, the Khazarian Empire under King Bulan adopted the traditions of the Israelites and mixed it with paganism and called it Judaism. Yes, we know your history too. Then after the, so the Holocaust, which was, was politically motivated, the elite used that as a pretext to invade the land of Israel and took those Khazarian converts and placed them in that land in 1948. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. Jewish troops routed Arab forces from the city of Haifa in the first of a series of battles that were to reverberate through the years. In the year of independence, fighting was fierce in the Negev desert area. Here, Israeli troops routed the Arabs and took hundreds of prisoners. Meanwhile, on May 14, 1948, the new government, headed by David Ben-Gurion, is installed in Tel Aviv. Thus, for the first time since the Roman legion destroyed Jerusalem in the year 70 AD, the Jewish people have a nation of their own. United Nations teams accompany Israeli soldiers under the white flag to retrieve the bodies of soldiers killed in the continuing strife with Arab troops. The UN was able to effect some uneasy pacts calling for a truce, but skirmishes continued to break out. Dr. Chaim Weizmann joined Premier Ben-Gurion in the government. The Jewish patriot became president as Israel went before the United Nations to seek a place in that world body. The Middle Eastern Arabic nations were in violent opposition, and when Israel was voted a membership, they walked out in a body. For the rest of the day, their seats remained empty, but they returned the next morning to no further incident. Thus, history was made as the Jewish state of Israel was born. Conceived in strife and weaned on violence, Israel has flourished to become a constructive voice in world affairs. Her flag became a symbol of hope to destabilize the Middle East. Prior to that, those people never lived in the land of Israel. Prior to 1948, those people never stepped foot in the land of Israel. Those are Europeans hiding themselves, European Romans hiding themselves under Jewish. That's what they keep doing each time. They keep going different places and taking on different nationalities. They're the same exact people. These are the same exact people that funded your transatlantic slave trade. Yes, the same Jewish man, the same Romans. These are the same people that's responsible for your 400 year short span black history curriculum. These are the same exact people that control the media outlets and push rap music on the whole black community and support it and, 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 and push it on the forefront. The same exact people. They control all the media. These are the same exact people that are responsible for your Christian churches in all the neighborhoods in the black community. The Bible says when the real Jews get in the land of Israel, there will be no more war. Since those converts, Khazarian converts, went into the land, it's only been war. They don't fit the prophecies. They over there dealing with Satan. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy 
of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan, using the Babylonian Talmud as their authoritative uh, source. These people are not the real Jews and they have nothing to do with the Most High God and the biblical Israelites. They're not the real Jews and they're dealing with Satan at the highest level. What are these nations trying to accomplish by suppressing all this information? What you're gonna realize is that there's a group of nations that are confederate together that have been trying to get rid of the Israelites from way back when so they can offset the Bible prophecies. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. The elite know that America, according to the Bible, is the last kingdom before the return of the Messiah. It's the last reigning kingdom called Babylon the Great or the Little Horn. And they're trying to offset prophecy and prolong their rulership because they know that when Christ returns, he and the 144,000 are gonna be the next ruling government on the planet earth. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. The elite don't want this prophecy to go forth. They're gonna do anything in their power to offset the prophecies and prolong their rulership. Because they know that once the Israelites are in rulership or in authority, that all these nations that had a hand in enslaving the Israelites, they're all going in captivity. It's gonna be their turn for servitude. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the stranger shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob and the people shall take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids and they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. Therefore, all they that devour thee shall be devoured, and all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. And they that spoil thee shall be a spoil, and all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. The elite have got together with their top scholars in their think tanks and they know these prophecies to a T. They didn't study this book back and forth. They understand all the breakdowns and prophecies. So in order to prevent these things, they have to suppress history and rewrite history and flood the media outlets with all types of futile material like rap music, Atlanta Housewives, and other reality TV nonsense to keep your mind occupied on entertainment and diverted from anything with any significance. And the success rate of that to black people is extremely high. The black man won't pick up a book if his life depended on it. The, a book is kryptonite to the black man. It's like spraying raid on a roach. They say if you wanna hide anything from a black man, you put it in a book. 
But despite these efforts of trying to offset prophecy, there's Israelites waking up all over the world by the thousands coming up out of sleep and getting rid of these Gentile gods and coming back to the Most High God, the Creator of heaven and earth, and keeping their end of the bargain. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. The kingdom of heaven rulership, the governing body is being set up right now in the midst of everyone and nobody even knows it. While America is on an economic decline, God is raising up the ruling government of the kingdom of heaven. He says, even though the children of Israel are as the sand of the sea, only a small remnant are going to be saved from his wrath. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Because the majority of you Israelites are going to be too caught up and bugged out of your mind and caught up in the world and caught up in Christianity to even give the Creator a, a thought and even to consider to go back and keep your part of the covenant. But God says, He's not sending you in slavery no more. He says, if you didn't learn this time from all the captivities you've been under, if you didn't learn from getting your backs whipped, if you didn't learn from being hanged, if you didn't learn from having your sons and daughters sold, he says, I'm not bringing you into captivity no more after America. This is the last captivity. He has another plan for you. You got another punishment coming. It's called the lake of fire. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And you're going to be there for a very long time. But to those that have an ear and come back and return to the Heavenly Father, He's going to make a new covenant with you. For finding fault with them, He saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The Bible says that the new covenant is with the Israelites. Not all nations. He made the first covenant with you and he's making the next covenant with you as well. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. What does it mean after those days? It's talking about when you get into the wilderness. Yes, you have to go to the wilderness again. The same way when you came out of Egypt and you went into the wilderness and made the first covenant is the same exact way when you come out of America, which is the modern Egypt, you're going to have to go into the wilderness again. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. The covenant is going to be made after Christ returns. That's the new covenant. Then there's a new covenant now. You're still under the same exact covenant you made when you came out of Egypt. That's a binding covenant right now. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. 
And God says he's going to put his laws in your mind. Yes, those same laws that your Christian church teaches are done away with. Those are the laws that are going to govern the kingdom of heaven. The same way America has their laws that govern America. The laws written in the Bible in the first five books of Moses. Those are the laws that's going to govern the kingdom of heaven. Those are the same exact laws that you promised and made a pact with the Most High saying that you would keep and you refuse to keep to this day. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say unto the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. In these same exact places where you were scattered for a reproach and called by different names like African American, Negro, and colored people, and where you were told in church that you were a Gentile, in these same exact places, it's now being told to you that you're actually the children of Israel. Prophecy is being fulfilled right now. It's up to you now to make a choice. Either you're going to come back and keep your end of the bargain, or are you going to still stay out in the world? And if you stay out in the world, the only thing you can look forward to is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Most High is extending out His hand one last time. It's either you're going to repent and come back, or you're going to die in your sins. You can hang on to whatever you want. You still want to worship the Gentiles' gods? You go for it. The Gentiles can teach that the law is done away with. They wasn't back there in, uh, in the wilderness and they wasn't back there with, with the blood sprinkled on them. They wasn't under a covenant. They, didn't, they weren't back there saying we will obey. You did. The Most High never gave them no laws to keep. But he gave it to you. He showeth his word unto Jacob his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. So there's no punishment for them not keeping the laws. But there's a great punishment for you not keeping it. So it's time to decide. Either you're going to be in or you're out. But now you know who you are.